First of all, thank you for clicking on this video, but this video is not like any other video that you've ever seen. In a second, I'm going to be reading out an excerpt from a book, and that book is going to show you the step-by-step -step plan how you can implement the philosophy of Stoicism into your life. And by implementing this philosophy, you're going to find yourself very quickly having a lot less stress, you're going to know exactly what you want to do in life, and you're going to be able to get the things that you want done a lot quicker, a lot more efficiency, and with a lot less effort. Now before we get into that, there's a couple of things I want you to do. First of all, like this video, because what that's going to do is it's going to let me know that you like this type of video so I can make more content for you. Second of all, it's going to promote this video through the YouTube algorithm, which means that more people will be able to benefit from this video if you like it and they will be able to experience the magic of the philosophy of Stoicism. Second of all, if you've got anything to say throughout the start of this video, then make sure you leave a comment down below. Because what that's going to do is it's going to start a discussion and I'll be able to respond to you directly. Third of all, if you're new around here and like improving your life, then just click the subscribe button. And finally, before we get into the video, if you want to listen to this book completely free of charge, I'm going to leave a link below to Audible, which is where you'll be able to get a free trial and you'll be able to listen to this audiobook completely free of charge. Now let's get on to the incredible video. Practicing Stoicism. I will end this book by sharing some of the insights I have gained in my practice of Stoicism. In particular, I will offer advice on how individuals that are wishing to try Stoicism as their philosophy of life can derive the maximum benefits from the trial with the minimum efforts and frustration. I will also describe some of the surprises as well as some of the delights that lie in store for would-be Stoics. The first tip I would offer to those wishing to give Stoicism a try is to practice what I've referred to as stealth, stoicism. You would do well, I think, to keep it a secret that you are a practicing stoic. This would have been my own strategy had I not taken upon myself to become a teacher of stoicism. By practicing stoicism stealthily, you can gain its benefits whilst avoiding one significant cost, the teasing and outright mockery of your friends, relatives, neighbors, and co-workers. It is, I should add, quite easy to practice stoicism on the sly. You can, for example, engage in negative visualization without anyone being the wiser. If your practice of stoicism is successful, friends, relatives, neighbors, and co-workers might notice a difference in you, a change for the better, but they will probably be hard pressed to explain this transformation. If they come to you perplexed and ask you what your secret is, you might choose to reveal the sordid truth to them that you are a closet stoic. My next piece of advice for would-be Stoics is not to try to master all of the Stoic techniques at once, but to start with one technique and, having become proficient in it, go on to another. And a good technique to start with, I think, is negative visualization. At spare moments in the day, make it a point to contemplate the loss of whatever you value in life. Engaging in such contemplation can produce a dramatic transformation in your outlook on life. It can make you realize, if only for a time, how lucky you are, and how much you have to be thankful for, almost regardless of your circumstances. It is my experience that negative visualization is to daily living as salt is to cooking. Although it requires minimal time, energy, and talent for a cook to add salt to a food, the taste of almost any food he adds it to will be enhanced as a result. In much the same way, although practicing negative visualization requires minimal time, energy, and talent, those who practice it will find their capacity to enjoy life is significantly enhanced. You might find yourself, after engaging in negative visualization, embracing the very life that, a short time before, you had complained wasn't worth living. One thing I have discovered, though, in my practice of Stoicism, is that it is easy to forget to engage in negative visualization, and as a result, to go for days or even weeks without having visualized. I think I know why this happens. By engaging in negative visualization, we increase our satisfaction with our circumstances. But on gaining this sense of satisfaction, the natural thing to do is to simply enjoy life. Indeed, it is decidedly unnatural for someone who is satisfied with life to spend time thinking about the bad things that can happen. The Stoics, however, would remind us that negative visualization, besides making us appreciate what we have, can help us avoid it cling clinging onto the things we appreciate. Consequently, it is as important to engage in negative visualization when times are good as it is when times are bad. I tried making it my practice to engage in negative visualization each night at bedtime as part of the bedtime meditation described back in chapter 8. 
but the experiment failed. My problem is that I tend to fall asleep remarkably fast after my head hits the pillow. There simply isn't time to visualise. I have, instead, made it my practice to engage in negative visualisation and more generally to assess my progress as a Stoic whilst driving to work. By doing this, I transform idle time into time well spent. After mastering negative visualisation, a novice Stoic should move on to become proficient in applying the trichotomy of control described in chapter 5. According to the Stoics, we should perform a kind of triage in which we distinguish between things we have no control over, things we have complete control over, and things we have some but not complete control over. And having made this distinction, we should focus our attention on the last two categories. In particular, we waste our time and cause ourselves needless anxiety if we concern ourselves with things over which we have no control. I have discovered, by the way, that applying the trichotomy of control, besides helping me manage my own anxieties, is an effective technique for allaying the anxieties of the non-Stoics around me, which anxieties might otherwise disrupt my tranquility. When relatives and friends share with me the sources of anxiety in their life, it often turns out that the things they are worried about are beyond their control. My response to such cases is to point this out to them. What can you do about this situation? Nothing. Then why are you worrying about it? It is out of your hands, so it is pointless to worry. And if I'm in the mood, I follow this last comment with a quotation from Marx Aurelius. Nothing is worth doing pointlessly. It is interesting that even though some of the people I've tried this on can charitably be described as anxiety-prone, they almost always respond to the logic of the trichotomy of control. Their anxiety is dispelled, if only for a time. As a Stoic novice, you will want, as part of becoming proficient in applying the trichotomy of control, to practice internalising your goals. Instead of having winning a tennis match as your goal, for example, make it your goal to prepare for the match as best you can and to try your hardest in the match. By routinely internalising your goals, you can reduce, but probably not eliminate, what would otherwise be a significant source of distress in your life, the feeling that you have failed to accomplish some goal. In your practice of Stoicism, you will also want, in conjunction with applying the trichotomy of control, to become a psychological fatalist about the past and the present, but not about the future. Although you will be willing to think about the past and the present in order to learn things that can help you better deal with the obstacles to tranquility thrown your way in the future, you will refuse to spend your time engaging in, if only, thoughts about the past and present. You will realise that, inasmuch as the past and present cannot be changed, it is pointless to wish they could be different. You will do your best to accept the past, whatever it might have been, and to embrace the present, whatever it might be. Other people, as we have seen, are the enemy in our battle for tranquillity. It was for this reason that the Stoics spent time developing strategies for dealing with this enemy, and, in particular, strategies for dealing with the insults of those with whom we associate. One of the most interesting developments in my practice of Stoicism has been my transformation from someone who dreaded insults into an insult connoisseur. For one thing, I have become a collector of insults. On being insulted, I analyse and categorise this insult. For another thing, I look forward to being insulted in as much as it affords me the opportunity to perfect my insult game. I know this sounds strange, but one consequence of this practice of Stoicism is that one seeks opportunities to put Stoic techniques to work. I will have more to say about this phenomenon below. One of the things that makes insults difficult to deal with is that they generally come as surprises. You are calmly chatting with someone when, wham, he says something that, although it might not have been intended as an insult, can easily be constructed as one. For example, recently, I was talking to a colleague about a book he was writing. He said that in this book he was going to comment on some political material I had published. I was delighted that he was aware of my work and was going to mention it, but then there came the put-down. I'm trying to decide, he said, whether in my response to what you have written, I should categorise you as evil or merely misguided. Realise that such comments are to be expected from academics. We're a pathetically contentious lot. We want others not only to be aware of our work, but to admire it, and better still, to defer to the conclusions we have drawn. The problem is that our colleagues seek the same admiration and deference from us. Something has to give, and as a result, on campuses everywhere, 
academics routinely engage in verbal fisticuffs. Put-downs are commonplace and insults fly. In my pre-Stoic days, I would have felt the sting of this insult and probably would have gotten angry. I would have vigorously defended my work and would have done my best to unleash a counter-insult. But on that particular day, having fallen under the influence of the Stoics, I had the presence of mind to respond to this insult in a stoically acceptable manner, with self-depreciating humour. Why can't you portray me as both evil and misguided, I asked. Self-depreciating humour has become my standard response to insults. When someone criticises me, I reply that matters are even worse than he is suggesting. If, for example, someone suggests that I am lazy, I reply that it is a miracle that I get any work done at all. If someone accuses me of having a big ego, I reply that on most days it is noon before I become aware that anyone else inhabits the planet. Such responses may seem counterproductive since in offering them, I am in a sense validating the insulter's criticisms of me. But by offering such responses, I make it clear to the insulter that I have enough confidence in who I am to be impervious to his insults. For me, they are a laughing matter. Furthermore, by refers refusing to play the insult game, by refusing to respond to an insult with a counter-insult, I make it clear that I regard myself as being above such behaviour. My refusal to play the insult game will likely irritate the insulter more than a counter-insult would. One of the worst things we can do when other people annoy us is to get angry. The anger will, after all, be a major obstacle to our tranquillity. The Stoics realised that anger is anti-joy and that it can ruin our life if we let it. In the course of observing my emotions, I have paid careful attention to anger and as a result have discovered a few things about it. To begin with, I have become fully aware of the extent to which anger has a life of its own within me. It can lie dormant like a virus only to revive and make me miserable when I least expect it. I might, for example, be in yoga class trying to empty my head of thoughts when out of nowhere I find myself filled with anger about some incident that took place years before. Furthermore, I have drawn the conclusion that Seneca was mistaken in suggesting that there is no pleasure in expressing anger. This is the problem with anger. It feels good to vent it and feels bad to suppress it. Indeed, when our anger is righteous anger, when we are confident that we are right and whomever we are angry at is wrong, it feels quite wonderful to vent it and let the person who wronged us know of our anger. Anger, in other words, resembles a mosquito bite. It feels bad not to scratch a bite and feels good to scratch it. The problem with mosquito bites, of course, is that after you scratch one, you typically wish you hadn't done so. The itch returns, intensified, and by scratching the bite, you increase the chance that it will become infected. Much the same can be said of anger. Although it feels good to vent it, you will probably, subsequently, regret having done so. It is one thing to vent anger, or better still, feign anger, with the goal of modifying someone's behaviour. People do respond to anger. What I have discovered, though, is that a significant portion of the anger I vent can be explained in these terms. When I'm driving a car, for example, I periodically get angry, righteously, I think, at other drivers who drive incompetently, and sometimes I even yell at them. Since my windows and theirs are rolled up, the other drivers can't hear me, and therefore can't respond to my anger by not doing again in the future whatever it was that made me mad. This anger, although righteous, is utterly pointless. By venting it, I accomplish nothing other than to disturb my own tranquillity. In other cases, although I am righteously angry at someone, I cannot, because of my circumstances, express my anger directly to him. So instead, I find myself having black thoughts about him. Again, these feelings of anger are pointless. They disturb me, but have no impact at all on the person at whom I am angry. Indeed, if anything, they serve to compound the harm he does to me. What a waste. I have found, by the way, that practicing stoicism has helped me reduce the frequency with which I get angry at other drivers. I yell perhaps a tenth as often as I used to. It has also helped me reduce the number of black thoughts I have about people who wronged me long ago. And when black thoughts do infect me, they don't last as long as they used to. Because anger has these characteristics, because it can lie dormant within us and because it feels good to vent, our anger will become difficult to overcome 
and learning to overcome it is one of the biggest challenges a Stoic practitioner faces. But one thing I have found is that the more you think about and understand anger, the easier it is to control it. As it so happens, I read Seneca's essay on anger while waiting at a doctor's office. The doctor was woefully behind schedule, and as a result, I was left sitting in the waiting room for nearly an hour. I had every right to be angry, and in my pre-Stoic days I almost certainly would have been angry. But because I was thinking about anger during that hour, I found it impossible to get angry. I have also found that it is quite useful to use humour as a defence against anger. In particular, I have found that one wonderful way to avoid getting angry is to imagine myself as a character in an absurdist play. Things aren't supposed to make sense, people aren't supposed to be competent, and justice, when it happens at all, happens by accident. Instead of letting myself be angered by events, I persuade myself to laugh at them. Indeed, I try to think of ways the imaginary absurdist playwright could have made things still more absurd. Seneca, I am certain, was right when he pointed to laughter as the proper response to things which drive us to tears. Seneca also observes that he shows a greater mind who does not restrain his laughter than he who does not restrain his tears, since the laughter gives expression to the mildest of emotions and deems that there is nothing important, nothing serious, nor wretched either, in the whole outfit of life. Besides advising us to imagine bad things happening to us, the Stoics, as we have seen, advise us to cause bad things to happen as the result of our undertaking a program of voluntary discomfort. Seneca, for example, advises us periodically to live as if we were poor, and Masonius advises us to do the things to cause ourselves discomfort. Following this advice requires a greater degree of self-discipline than practicing the other Stoic techniques. Programs of voluntary discomfort are therefore best left to advanced Stoics. I have experimented with the program of voluntary discomfort. I have not attempted to go barefoot, as Masonius suggested, but I have tried less radical behaviour, such as underdressing for winter weather, not heating my car in the winter, and not air conditioning it in the summer. I have also started taking yoga classes. Yoga has improved my balance and flexibility, reminded me of the importance of play, and have made me acutely aware of how little control I have over the contents of my mind. But besides conferring these and other benefits on me, yoga has been a wonderful source of voluntary discomfort. While doing yoga, I twist myself into poses that are uncomfortable or that in some cases border on being painful. I will, for example, bend my legs until they are at the very edge of a cramp and then back off a bit. My yoga teacher, though, never talks about pain. Instead, she talks about poses giving rise to too much sensation. She has taught me how to breathe into the place that hurts, which of course is physiologically impossible if what I am experiencing is, say, a leg cramp. And yet, the technique undeniably works. Another source of discomfort, and admittedly of entertainment and delight as well, is rowing. Shortly after I began practicing stoicism, I learned to row a racing shell and have since started racing competitively. We rowers are exposed to heat and humidity in the summer, and to cold, wind, and sometimes even snow in the spring and fall. We are periodically splashed, unceremoniously, with water. We develop blisters and then calluses. Whittling down calluses is my favourite off-water activity of serious rowers. Besides being a source of physical discomfort, rowing is a wonderful source of emotional discomfort. In particular, rowing has provided me with a list of fears to overcome. The racing shells I row are quite unstable. Indeed, given half a chance, they will gleefully dump a rower into the water. It took me considerable effort to overcome my fear of flipping, by successfully surviving three flips. From there, I went on to work through other fears, including a fear of rowing in the pre-dawn darkness, a fear of pushing off from the dock while standing up in the boat, and a fear of being out in the middle of a lake hundreds of yards from the nearest shore in a tiny boat that has thrice betrayed me. Whenever you undertake an activity in which public failure is a possibility, you are likely to experience butterflies in your stomach. I mentioned above that since becoming a Stoic, I have become a collector of insults. I have also become a collector of butterflies. I like to engage in activities such as competitive rowing that give me butterflies, simply so I can practice dealing with them. 
These feelings are, after all, an important component of the fear of failure, so that by dealing with them, I am working to overcome my fear of failure. In the hours before a race, I experience some truly magnificent butterflies. I do my best to turn them into my advantage. They make me focus on the race that lies ahead. Once the race has begun, I have the pleasure of watching the butterflies depart. I have also turned elsewhere in my pursuit of butterflies. After I began practicing stoicism, for example, I decided to learn how to play a musical instrument, something I had never done before. The instrument I chose was the banjo. After several months of lessons, my teacher asked if I wanted to participate in the recital his students give. I initially rejected the offer. It sounded like no fun at all to risk public humiliation trying to play a banjo in front of a bunch of strangers. But then it occurred to me that this was a wonderful opportunity to cause myself psychological discomfort and to confront and hopefully vanquish my fear of failing. I agreed to take part. The recital was the most stress-inducing event I had experienced in a long time. It isn't that I have a fear of crowds. I can, with zero anxiety, walk into a classroom of 60 students I have never met and start lecturing them. But this was different. Before my performance, I experienced butterflies the size of small bats. Not only that, but I also slipped into an altered state of consciousness in which time was distorted and the laws of physics seemed to stop working. But to make a long story short, I survived the recital. The butterflies I experienced racing in a regatta of giving a banjo recital are, of course, a symptom of anxiety. And it might seem contrary to Stoic principles to go out of my way to cause myself anxiety. Indeed, if a goal of Stoicism is the attainment of tranquility, shouldn't I go out of my way to avoid anxiety-inducing activities? Shouldn't I, rather than collecting butterflies, fee from them? Not at all. In causing myself anxiety by, for example, giving a banjo recital, I have precluded much anxiety in my life. Now, when faced with a new challenge, I have a wonderful bit of reasoning I can use. Compared to the banjo recital, this new challenge is nothing. I survived that challenge, so surely I will survive this one. By taking part in the recital, in other words, I immunized myself against a fair amount of future anxiety. It is an immunization, though, that will wear off with the passage of time, and I will need to be re-immunized with another dose of butterflies. When doing things to cause myself physical and mental discomfort, I view myself, or at any rate a part of me, as an opponent in a kind of game. This opponent, my other self, as it were, is on an evolutionary autopilot. He wants nothing more than to be comfortable and to take advantage of whatever opportunities for pleasure present themselves. My other self lacks self-discipline. Left to his own devices, he will always take the path of least resistance through life and as a result will be little more than a simple-minded pleasure seeker. He is also a coward. My other self is not my friend. To the contrary, he is best regarded in the words of Epictetus as an enemy lying in the wait. To win points in the contest with my other self, I must establish my dominance over him. To do this, I must cause him to experience discomfort he could easily have avoided, and I must prevent him from experiencing pleasures he might otherwise have enjoyed. When he is scared of doing something, I must force him to confront his fears and overcome them. Why play this game against myself? In part, to gain self-discipline. And why is self-discipline worth possessing? Because those who possess it have the ability to determine what they do with their life. Those who lack self-discipline will have the path they take through life determined by someone or something else. And as a result, there is very real danger that they will mislive. Playing the game against my other self also helps me build character. These days I realise people smirk at talk of building character, but it is an activity that the Stoics would have heartily endorsed and would have recommended to anyone wishing to have a good life. One other reason for playing the game against my other self is that it is, somewhat surprisingly, fun to do. It is quite enjoyable to win a point in this game by, for example, successfully overcoming a fear. The Stoics realised as much. Epictetus, as we saw in chapter 7, talks about the pleasure to be derived from denying ourselves various pleasures. Along similar lines, Seneca reminds us that even though it may be unpleasant to endure something, we will, on successfully enduring it, be pleased with ourselves. 
When I row competitively, it may look as though I am trying to beat the other rowers, but I am in fact engaged in a much more significant competition, the one against my other self. He didn't want to learn to row. He didn't want to do workouts, preferring instead to spend the pre-dawn hours asleep in a warm bed. He didn't want to row to the starting line of the race. Indeed, on the way there, he repeatedly whined about how tired he felt, and during the race, he wanted to quit rowing and simply let the others rowers win. If you just quit rowing, he would say in the most seductive voice, all of this pain would come to an end. Why not just quit? Think of how good it would feel. It is curious, but my competitors in a race are simultaneously my teammates in the much more important competition against my other self. By racing against each other, we are all simultaneously racing against ourselves, although not all of us is consciously aware that we are doing so. To race against each other, we must individually overcome ourselves, our fears, our laziness, our lack of self-discipline. And it is entirely possible for someone to lose the competition against the other rowers, indeed to come in last, but in the process of doing so, to have triumphed in the competition against his other self. The Stoics, as we have seen, recommended simplifying one's lifestyle. Like programs of voluntary discomfort, lifestyle simplification is the process best left to advanced Stoics. As I have explained, a novice Stoic would probably want to keep a low philosophical profile. If you start dressing down, people will notice. Likewise, people will notice if you keep driving the same old car, or horrors, give up the car to take the bus or ride a bike. People will assume the worst impending bankruptcy, or even the early stages of mental illness. And if you explain to them that you have overcome your desire to impress those who are impressed by a person's external trappings, you will only make matters worse. When I started experimenting with a simplified lifestyle, it took some getting used to. When, for example, someone asked me where I'd gotten a t-shirt I was wearing, and I answered that I had bought it at the thrift store, I found myself feeling a bit ashamed. This incident made me appreciate Cato's manner of dealing with such feelings. Cato, as we have seen, dressed differently as a kind of training exercise. He wanted to teach himself to be ashamed only of what were really shameful. He therefore went out of his way to do things that would trigger inappropriate feelings of shame in himself, simply so he could try and practice overcoming such feelings. I have lately been trying to emulate Cato in this respect. Since becoming a Stoic, my desires have changed dramatically. I no longer want many of the things I once took to be essential for proper living. I used to dress natally, but my wardrobe has lately become what can best be described as utilitarian. I have one tie and one sport coat that I can don if required. Fortunately, they are rarely required. I used to long for a new car, but when my 16-year-old car recently died, I replaced it with a 9-year-old car something that a decade ago I could not have imagined myself doing. The new car, by the way, has two things that my old car lacked, a cup holder and a working radio. What joy. There was a time when I would have understood why someone would have wanted a Rolex watch. Now such behaviour puzzles me. I used to have less money than I knew what to do with. This is no longer the case. In large part, because I want so few of the things that money can buy. I read that many of my fellow Americans are so deep in financial trouble. They have an unfortunate tendency to use up all of the credit that is available to them, and when this doesn't satisfy their cravings for consumer goods, they keep spending anyway. Many of these individuals, one suspects, would be affluent rather than bankrupt, and far happier as well, if they had only developed their capacity to to enjoy life's simple pleasures. I've become dysfunctional as a consumer. When I go to a mall, for example, I don't buy things. Instead, I look around me and I'm astonished by all of the things for sale that not only I don't need, but I can't imagine myself wanting. My only entertainment at the mall is to watch the other mall goers. Most of them, I suspect, come to the wall not because there is something specific that they need to buy. Rather, they come in the hope that doing so will trigger a desire for something that, before going to the mall, they didn't want. It might be a desire for a cashmere sweater, a set of socket wrenches, or the latest cell phone. Why go out of their way to trigger a desire? Because if they trigger one, they can enjoy the rush that comes when they extinguish that desire by buying its object. 
It is a rush, of course, that has little to do with their long-term happiness, as taking a hit of heroin has to do with their long-term happiness of a heroin addict. Having said this, I should add that the reason I have so few consumer desires is not because I consciously fight their fo formation. To the contrary, such desires have simply stopped popping into my head, or, at any rate, they don't pop nearly as often as they used to. In other words, my ability to form desires for consumer goods seems to have disappeared. What brought about this state of affairs? Well, the profound realisation, thanks to the practice of Stoicism, that acquiring the things that those in my social circle typically crave and work hard to afford will, in the long run, make zero difference in how happy I am and will in no way contribute to my having a good life. In particular, were I to acquire a new car, a fine wardrobe, a Rolex watch and a bigger house, I am convinced that I would experience no more joy than I presently do, and might even experience less. As a consumer, I have seemed to have crossed some kind of great divide. It seems unlikely that, having crossed it, I will ever be able to return to the mindless consumerism that I have once found to be so entertaining. Let me now describe a surprising side effect of the practice of Stoicism. As a Stoic, you will be constantly preparing yourself for hardship by, for example, engaging in negative visualization or voluntarily causing yourself discomfort. If hardship doesn't follow, it is possible for a curious kind of disappointment to set in. You might find yourself wishing that your stoicism would be put to the test so you can see whether you, in fact, possess the skills at hardship management that you have worked hard to acquire. You are, in other words, like a firefighter who has practiced his firefighting skills for years, but who has never been called on to put out an actual fire, or like a football player who, despite diligently practicing all season long, has never been put in a game. Along these lines, the historian Paul Vane has commented that if we attempt to practice stoicism, a calm life is actually disquieting because we are unaware of whether we would remain strong in the case of a tempest. Likewise, according to Seneca, when someone attempts to harm a wise man, he might actually welcome the attempt, since the injuries can't hurt him, but can help him. Seneca also suggests that a Stoic might welcome death, inasmuch as it represents the ultimate test of his Stoicism. Although I have not been practicing Stoicism for very long, I have discovered in myself a desire to have my stoicism tested. I already mentioned my desire to be insulted. I want to see whether I will respond to insults in a stoically appropriate manner. I have likewise gone out of my way to put myself into situations that test my courage and willpower, in part to see whether I can pass such tests. And while I was writing this book, an incident took place that gave me a deeper understanding of the Stoics' desire to have their Stoicism tested. The incident in question began when I noticed flashes of light along the periphery of my visual field whenever I blinked my eyes in a dark room. I went to my eye doctor and was informed that I had a torn retina, and that to prevent my retina from detaching, I should undergo laser surgery. The nurse who prepared me for the surgery explained that the doctor would repeatedly zap my retina with a high-powered laser beam. She asked whether I had ever seen a light show and said that that was what I was about to witness, and it was a spectacle far more splendid than that. The doctor then entered the room and started zapping me. The first pops of light were indeed intense and beautiful, but then something unexpected happened. I stopped seeing the bursts of light. I could still hear the laser popping and saw nothing. Indeed, when the laser had finally turned off, all I could see through that eye that had operated on was a purple blob that covered my entire visual field. It occurred to me that something might have gone wrong during the surgery. Perhaps the laser had malfunctioned, and that I might, as a result, now be blind in one eye. This thought was unsettling, to be sure. But after having thought about it, I detected in myself another, wholly unexpected thought. I found myself reflecting on how I would respond to being blind in one eye. In particular, how I would be able to deal with this in a proper stoic fashion. I was, in other words, responding to the possible loss of sight in an eye by sizing up the stoic test potential of such a loss. This response probably seems strange to you. It seemed and still seems strange to me as well. 
Nevertheless, this was my response. And in responding this way, I was apparently experiencing a predictable, and some would say perverse, side effect of the practice of stoicism. I informed the nurse that I could not see in that eye that had been operated on. She told me, at last, why didn't she tell me before, that this was normal that my vision would come back within an hour. It did, and as a result, I was deprived, thankfully, I think, of this opportunity to have my stoicism tested. Unless an untimely death prevents it, I will, in about a decade, be confronted with a major test of my stoicism. I will be in my mid-sixties. I will, in other words, be on the threshold of old age. Throughout my life, I have sought role models, people who were in the next stage of life and who I thought were handling that stage successfully. On reaching my fifties, I started examining the seventy and eighty-year-olds I knew in an attempt to find a role model. It was easy, I discovered, to find people in that age group who could serve as negative role models. My goal, I thought, should be to avoid ending up like them. Positive role models, however, proved to be in short supply. When I went to the 70 and 80 year olds I knew and asked for advice on dealing with the onset of old age, they had an annoying tendency to offer the same nugget of wisdom. Don't get old. Barring the discovery of a fountain of youth drug, though, the only way I can act on this advice is to commit suicide. It has subsequently occurred to me that this is precisely what they were advising me to do, albeit in an oblique manner. It has also occurred to me that their advice not to get old echoes Masonius' observation that he, he is blessed who dies not late, but well. It is possible that when I am in my 70s or 80s I will conclude, as the elderly people I know seem to have concluded, that non-existence is preferable to old age. It is also possible, though, that many of those who find old age to be so burdensome have themselves to blame for their predicament. They neglected, whilst young, to prepare for old age. Had they taken the time to properly prepare themselves, had they, in particular, started practicing stoicism, it is conceivable that they would not have found old age to be burdensome. Instead, they might have found it to be, as Seneca claimed, one of the most delightful stages of life, a stage that is full of pleasure if one knows how to use it. While I was writing this book, my 80-year-old mother had a stroke and was banished, by me as it so happens, to a nursing home. The stroke so weakened the left side of her body that she was no longer able to get out of bed by herself. Not only that, but her ability to swallow was compromised, making it dangerous for her to eat regular foods and drink regular liquids, which might go down her windpipe and trigger a potentially fatal bout of pneumonia. The food she was served had to be pureed, and the liquids she was given had to be thickened. There is, I discovered, a whole line of thickened beverages that have been created for people with swallowing problems. Quite understandably, my mother was unhappy with the, life her, with the turn her life had taken, and I did my best to encourage her. Were I devoutly religious, I might have attempted to cheer her up by praying with her, or for her, or by telling her that I had arranged for tens or even hundreds of people to pray on her behalf. As it was, though, I found that the best words of encouragement I had to offer had a distinctly stoical ring to them. She would, for example, tell me how difficult his situation was, and I would quote Marcus, Yes, they say life is more like wrestling than like dancing. That's very true, she would murmur in reply would ask me what she had to do to be able to walk again. I thought it was unlikely that she would ever walk again, but did not say as much. Instead, I encouraged her to internalise her goals with respect to walking. What you need to do is concentrate on doing your very best when they give you physical therapy. She would complain about having lost much of the function of her left arm, and I would encourage her to engage in negative visualisation. At least you have the ability to speak, I would remind her. In the first days after the stroke, you could only mumble. Back then you couldn't even move your right arm and consequently couldn't feed yourself, but now you can. Really, you have lots to be thankful for. She would listen to my reaction and, after a moment of reflection, she would usually respond affirmatively. I suppose I do. The exercise in negative visualisation seemed to take the edge of her distress, if only temporarily. Time after time during this period, I was struck by how natural and appropriate it is to invoke stoic principles to help someone cope with the challenges of old age and ill health. I mentioned above that the stroke made it dangerous for my mother to drink regular unthickened water. Being denied water made her quite naturally start to crave it. She would ask me in a pleading voice for a glass of water, not thick but from the sink. 
I would refuse the request and explain why, but as soon as I finished my explanation, she would just ask again, just a glass of water, please. I found myself in the position of a loving son who is continually denying his elderly mother's request for a simple glass of water. After enduring my mother's pleas for a time, I asked the nurse what to do. Give her ice cubes to suck on, she said. The water in the ice will be released slowly, so there is little danger that she will aspirate it. As a result of this advice, I became my mother's personal ice man, bringing a cup on each visit. The ice man cometh, I would call out on arriving at her room. I would pop a cube into her mouth, and she would, while sucking at it, tell me how wonderful the ice was. My mother, who in her prime had been a connoisseur of fine food and drink, had now become a connoisseur of ice cubes, something she had taken for granted her entire life. For her, an ice cube had merely been the thing you used to cool a beverage worth drinking, was now giving her intense pleasure. She clearly enjoyed this ice more than a gourmet would have enjoyed vintage champagne. Watching her suck appreciatively on ice cubes, I felt a tinge of envy. Wouldn't it be wonderful, I thought, to be able to derive this much pleasure from a simple ice cube? It is, in, I decided, unlikely that negative visualization alone would enable me to appreciate ice cubes as intensely as my mother does. Unfortunately, it would probably take a stroke like hers to do the trick. Nevertheless, watching her suck on ice cubes has been quite instructive. It has made me cognizant of yet another thing that I take utterly for granted my ability to gulp down a big glass of cold water on a hot summer's day. During one visit to my mother, I encountered the ghost of Christmas fortune. I was walking down the hall of the nursing home towards my mother's room. Ahead of me was an elderly gentleman in a wheelchair being pushed by an attendant. When I got close, the attendant got my attention and said, pointing to her in charge, This man is a professor too. My mother, it turns out, had been telling everyone about me. I stopped and said hello to this fellow academic, who, it turned out, had retired some time before. We chatted for a while, but during our conversation I was haunted by the thought that in a few decades I might have this conversation again, only then it would be me in the wheelchair, and it would be some younger professor standing in front of me, taking a few minutes out of his buzzy day to talk to an academic relic. The time is coming, I told myself, and I must do what I can to prepare for it. The goal of Stoicism, as we have seen, is the attainment of tranquility. Readers will naturally want to know whether my own practice of Stoicism has helped me attain this goal. It has not, alas, allowed me to attain perfect tranquility. It has, however, resulted in me being subsequently more tranquil than my formerly was the case. In particular, I have made considerable progress in taming my negative emotions. I am less prone to anger than I used to be, and when I found myself venting, my anger at others... I am much more willing to apologise than was formerly the case. I am not only more tolerant of put-downs than I used to be, but have developed a near-complete immunity to garden-variety insults. I am also less anxious than I once was about the disasters that might befall me, and in particular about my own death, although the real test for this, as Seneca says, will be when I am about to take my last breath. Having said this, I should add that although I might not have tamed my negative emotions, I have not eradicated them nor is that likely that I ever will. I am never, nevertheless delighted to have deprived these emotions of some of the power they used to have over me. One significant psychological change that has taken place since I started practicing Stoicism is that I experience far less dissatisfaction than I used to. Apparently as the result of practicing negative visualization, I have become quite appreciative of what I've got. There remains to be sure the question of whether I would continue to be appreciative if my circumstances changed dramatically. Perhaps, without realising it, I have come to cling to the things I appreciate, in which case I would be devastated to lose those things. I won't know the answer to this question, of course, until my Stoicism is put to the test. One other discovery I have made in my practice of Stoicism concerns joy. The joy the Stoics were interested in can be best described as a kind of objectless enjoyment, an enjoyment not of any particular thing, but of all this. It is a delight as simply being able to participate in life. It is a profound realisation that even though all of this didn't have to be possible, it is possible, wonderfully, magnificently possible. For the record, my practice of Stoicism has not enabled me to experience unbroken joy, Far from it, nor have I experienced the kind of joy that a Stoic sage might experience, 
a joy at the realization that his joy cannot be disrupted by external events. But my practice of Stoicism does seem to have made me susceptible to periodic outbursts of delight in all this. It is curious, but when I started experiencing these outbursts, I wasn't quite sure what to make of them. Should I embrace my feelings of joy, or hold them at an arm's length? Indeed, should I, as a sober-minded adult, attempt to extinguish them? Then it dawned on me what utter foolishness it would have been to do anything other than embrace them, and so I have. These comments, I realise, make me sound disgustingly self-satisfied and boastful to boot. Rest assured that the practice of Stoicism does not require people to go around telling others how delighted they are, or to be alive or about the outbursts of joy that they have lately been experiencing. Indeed, the Stoics doubtless would have discouraged this sort of thing. Why, then, am I telling you about my state of mind? Because it answers the question you naturally have. Does Stoicism deliver the psychological goods it promises? In my case, it did, to a more than satisfactory extent. Having made this point, though, I will in the future do my best to be admirably modest in any public assessments I offer regarding my state of mind.